So Peter just told you about the physical and chemical aspects of magnetic reception, and now it is my job to try to tell you about the bio biology and the biological evidence we have that this mechanism suggested by Peter may be right. But first, I would like to remind you about the magnetic field that you have seen quite a few times in this school, and that there are two aspects of the field that could be useful, at least two aspects that could be useful for navigation. One is the compass direction given by the inclination of the field lines with, the, with, vert, with, with horizontal, with the Earth's surface. And the other one is that the intensity changes from about 60,000 nanoteslas at the poles to about 30,000 nanoteslas at the equator. And if you can detect this, you have a pretty good idea of your north-south position. So magnetic field could be useful for both. And as you will see now, there are two competing hypotheses about how magnetic sensing works in animals. One suggests that there are iron mineral crystals in the birds, it's iron mineral crystals in the upper beak somewhere. Uh, and uh, the uh, other hypothesis is the one you have just heard about, is light sensitive molecules in the eyes. And in this lecture I will give you some evidence that it could be that actually both are right, which is often the case in biology where there are two hypotheses that has been around for a long time, supported by evidence, it's often because both are right to a certain degree. But we will see. But first, I'm going to focus on this one. So light sensitive molecules in the, in the bird's eyes. Could they be responsible for magnetoreception? Well, theoretically, they could, as Peter has shown. And now it's our job as biologists to try to find out if any of the things that Peter has suggested, if any of those things actually exist. Uh, so, first of all, I'm a behavioral biologist, so let's start with behavior. So, as Peter already mentioned, uh, the Wilskos did experiments in the in 90s where they showed that if you do these Emlen funnel experiments where the birds are so eager to migrate that they jump in the direction in which they want to fly and then you turn the magnetic field and they start fly jumping in a different direction, if you do that experiment under white light, they are perfectly fine. White light has all wavelengths available. And if you do it on a, under limited chromatic light, you will basically see that they are okay under blue, turquoise, and green light, whereas they are challenged under yellow or red light. They do not sleep here. They can see yellow or red light because they are equally active. They jump around in the funnels, but they just start jump in random directions from night to night. And um, when birds can't see anything, so before you ask the typical question, why don't you test them in total darkness, the answer is that birds just sleep if you give them total darkness. Okay, but so it looks like they like, uh, their magnetic compass is wavelength dependent. And it's very difficult to explain without making a very long explanation, it's very difficult to explain why a magnetite-based compass should be light-dependent, because this little magnetite crystal would move to the magnetic field no matter if there's light there or not. In the radical pair mechanism suggested by Peter, light is essential, because if you don't have any light, you don't get the radical pair on which the magnetic field can work. Are the wavelengths of the photoreceptors uh, sensitivity in, in It will come. Okay. So, and then I would like... <laughs> no, I mean, it will come in five slides. So, <laughs> I will take it in the logical order. Uh, okay, and basically what you have here, I was asked in the break, uh, by two people actually, uh, how how can this ever be relevant when this lasts for a microsecond or maybe 10 microseconds max for signaling? Well, of course, this alone cannot be relevant. But as Peter already uh, said, that this is the magnetically sensitive part of the reaction. This reacts to a radical pair 2 here, which we know have a lifetime of milliseconds, 10 milliseconds approximately, which I will also show the data about that. And as Peter said, there's evidence now that this may be protonated and this leads to lifetimes of seconds. So even though the magnetic effects on this step are small in a single reaction, 
This is, of course, going on again and again and again. And if you accumulate signaling state for a second, then you can, of course, enhance the weak effects you have here on the microseconds scale. OK. Now, as a biologist, you would like to kind of imagine how could this be perceived? What, what could it be to the animal? And Peter already made a, 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 a drawing where I, that is similar to this one. So if you have the eye, it's like a half ball. And now you imagine you're hammering nails into this ball from all directions. And then you look into this eye. And you will now have nails oriented in all possible actual directions within this half ball. And basically now you could imagine that if you now look along the magnetic field lines, then in the back of the eye you could have molecules parallel to the field lines. That would lead to relatively many triplets and therefore to a light pixel. Around the edge of the eye, you would have molecules oriented perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. That would lead to relatively few triplets. And that would then generate a dark pixel. And in between, you would have a gray pixel. And all together, you could imagine that the bird would be seeing a shading on top of whatever else it was seeing. It's like a virtual visual image that is generated by the magnetic field mon modulation on the primary visual effect. Okay, so that's how you can imagine it. Now I'll show you in a few minutes why that pattern is unlikely to be true. But this is just uh, like to make it understandable to uh, uh, the general public. We have used this for, for a while. This assumes, of course, now that you compare from different parts of the eye. And that's highly unlikely, as I will come to in a moment. But OK, let's stay with this picture for a moment, because it's easy to understand and look at. Now, if you would be at the magnetic equator, and you would look north, you would see a pattern like this. If you would look east, you would see something like this. If you would look south, something like this. And if you would look west, something like that. You can now see at the magnetic equator, there would be an ambiguity. But as soon as you move away from the equator, this point will move up because of the inclination or down. OK? Now, there is one major challenge for the light-dependent magnetic reception hypothesis. And that is, how do the birds separate between variations in light intensity and the magnetic field change? This is a very important question. Because if we look at this reaction, it is clear that if we now change the light intensity, we are going to change the amount of product. So this is a major problem we have to think about. And that's why I don't believe that it's possible this will comparing from different parts of the eye, because different parts of the eye will have different amount of light coming in, unless it's completely homogeneous, which it's never. So <coughs> we, you need to have two sensors close to each other, and you need to have cryptochromes oriented ideally in some smart relationship to each other to be able to calculate out the light intensity, just like in polarized light detection or in color detection. You would need something similar. And in Peter and my review, we suggested that it could be that maybe the birch would use the so-called double cones for this. So these are outer segments of uh, a cone, uh, photoreceptor cells, which have membranes that are running together, and they are very close by each other. And work from uh, César in uh, Bonn, Benjamin Kaup's group, have shown that the old presumption and evidence that the, foot, that the uh, opsin molecules are basically freely rotating and floating around the membrane that Nahum mentioned before, that is true in high light levels. But it is not true at night. So at night, they form railway tracks. This is data from mouse, not from birds. And it's from uh, rods, so it's rhodopsin here. But in mouse rods, you see long, ra I call them railway, railway tracks, they are basically dimers of rhodopsins, and they are like 100 to 150 rhodopsin dimers long, and they align completely parallel in the membrane relative to the incisure that you have in each disc. 
And this incisure direction changes actually in most photo, in, in, in mouse photoreceptors, this incisure changes as you go down through the photoreceptor. But what if birds would have specialized um, uh, outer segments where you would have the incisure in one direction in one the one cone and in the other direction in the other cone? Then you could have something looking like a, a opponent effect like in polarized light detection. Or, yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is what I want to ask you. Couldn't this also account for the anatomy, anatomy for a possible polarization yes. sensitivity? Yes, that's possible. But o it would only work under low light conditions because already when you have room light, there are no tracks anymore. So it, it's, it would not work during the day. Okay, there's also a theoretical possibility that you could somehow um, uh, attach the cryptochromes to the inner segments because these are also like uh, cylinders. And, but that would be more tricky, and they, they would also be highly aligned. The good thing about those disks is they are highly aligned. So you could get consistent alignment, and you could get anchoring that would be different in two neighboring cells. That's theoretically possible. This has not been proven in birds at the moment. We are working with CESAR to try to find out whether this is the case in bird rods. Okay, so basically, there are different options particularly in photoreceptor cells, of how you could orient these molecules so that they could sense magnetic field changes independent of light intensity changes, because these photoreceptors would look at the same spot, very closely the same spot in, in, in nature. And Peter's uh, PhD student, Susanna Worster, basically has done a theoretical paper together with Peter and I recently where she has calculated a little bit what the, what the geometry should be in those two cells so that it excludes both the effect of polarized light and of light intensity. Because polarized light is also a problem because if you have polarized light you will have, uh, you will have more... Um, uh, if the polarization would be in plane of the flavin you will activate the flavin more than if it's perpendicular to the flavin. Yeah? And Susanna came up with a certain orientation which you can read in the paper and basically based on her model the pattern wouldn't look like the pattern uh, shown in the original papers but would look like this and the intersection point here would be 90 minus the inclination. So 90 degrees minus the inclination basically. So that's somewhat more likely that the pattern may look like that. Okay, so all of this is not proven. This is hypothesis how this could be solved and we are trying to work out if this is actually the case. So what we can ask for sure is which primary sensory molecule is responsible for light-dependent magnetoreception and as Peter already mentioned, the cryptochrome proteins are the only class of molecules known from vertebrates which form long-lived radical pairs upon photoexcitation. This has been suggested now for 17 years, and in those 17 years, no new suggestions has come up. Nobody has been able to find another protein in vertebrates, in plants there are others, but in, in vertebrates not, uh, which form long-lived radical pairs. So these are the only class of proteins that can be a candidate at the moment for light-dependent magnetoreception. So the first thing I did when I started my young research group, VW Nachwuchsgruppe, in 2002 in Oldenburg, was that I basically just asked a very, very simple question, are there cryptochromes in the eyes of birds? Because if there are no cryptochromes in the eyes of birds, mm, the, the hypothesis has a problem. So we uh, stained with antibodies against uh, uh, cryptochrome 1, and we found that, yeah, there are cryptochromes in the, in the photoreceptor layer, in the ganglion cell layer, and in some displaced ganglion cells. All right, that doesn't prove anything, of course, other than there are cryptochromes. It would be bad if there were none. The next question we asked is, okay, so it's fine that there are cryptochromes, but in order to be involved in magnetoreception, these cryptochromes must be active at night when birds perform magnetic compass orientation under moonlight or starlight conditions. There are never total darkness at light, night, just to make that clear. Even as a human, we are not adapted to night vision. We can see on an open field at night, and we are not, a bird is not uh, migrating in a rainforest. So in a rainforest, there can be times where it's almost total darkness, but as soon as you're out on an open field, there is always light. Okay, so let's see with uh, immediate early genes whether these neurons containing cryptochromes are actually active when a bird performs magnetic compass orientation, and we then did C-phosphate staining, 
And you can see that there is a very nice co-localization of cryptochrome and activity markers. And what we did next was that we then took the genetic code the, from the cryptochrome in a bird, in a garden warbler in the beginning, and basically we uh, asked the cell, we put it into a cell culture and we expressed this protein, so we had it in our hands, and then Peter basically looked at this uh, molecule. And what we, here is the absorption curve that was requested before. So this is the absorption uh, curve for this garden warbler cryptochrome, 1A. And if we compare with the orientation of the birds, you can see that fits very, fairly well with the fact that they can't orient on the yellow or red. It fits fairly well that they can orient on the blue turquoise. It does not fit particularly well with them being able to orient on the green. However, these were not truly monochromatic light conditions. They had quite some tail. So, but that's, that's just how it stands now. And you, of course, have to remember this is the molecule in isolation. It's not in the cell. It's not connected to anything which it would normally be connected to. But that's basically the absorption spectrum of the flavin when bound to a protein. OK. The next thing we asked, together with Peter, was to ask, do they form long-lived radical pairs? Because if they don't form long-lived radical pairs, this mechanism is not going to work. So Peter did transorption absorp tra transient absorption spectroscopy and could show that when you shine a short laser flash onto these cryptochromes, radical pairs are formed, and they have extraordinarily long lifetimes. The half-life is 10 milliseconds. So that's very long. So that's nice for the method, for, for the mechanism. We now know that what we thought we measured, maybe the magnetic radical here, that's not the only thing we measured. We measured probably that signaling state, or, or the, the RP2, the, the longer-lived radical. OK, but at least they form radicals. Again, this doesn't prove that this is involved, but it is a necess necessity for the mechanism to potentially be true. Uh, since uh, the first papers in, in, in mid-2000s, uh, much better antibodies have been made. And we have now, we and other groups, have made very specific antibodies to the different cryptochromes from the migratory birds. And I would like to say that all of you guys working in standard animals, you will be terribly unimpressed with the speed in which we, try, we figure this out. Because these are migratory birds, it's a European robins, you can buy nothing that's made for European robin, and you can't breed them in captivity. So this is a slight challenge for many methods. So we are a little bit slower. OK. But what we know now is that CRY1 B, so there are two uh, splice variants of CRY1 in birds. CRY1 A, uh, that's a bit difficult to see, but you should be able to see there are a few outer segments here that are stained. And these co-localize with UV opsin. So these are the UV cones. So CRY1A in these uh, night migratory birds, this is work by the Frankfurt group, Niesner et al., they could show that CRY1A is only in the outer segments of these UV cones. We did CRY1B, and CRY1B is a unique uh, cryptochrome splice variant for birds. So far it has not been found in, in any other group of animals. It may exist in others, but so far it has not been found. And if you look at that, that's found in ganglion cells, displaced ganglion cells, and in the inner segments of some photoreceptor cells. CRY2 is found in the nucleus of almost every cell in the retina, so that's highly likely to be a clock protein. Therefore, we are not terribly interested in CRY2. And now Anya, who's here, there, she has a poster here, and this is basically her poster in three slides. So Anya looked for cryptochrome 4, because cryptochrome 4 is a new cryptochrome that's only found in fish, birds, and reptiles so far. And basically, it's in the outer segments of photoreceptors. And it's not in all photoreceptors, because if you co-stain with UV opsin, there's no overlap whatsoever. If you co-stain with blue opsin, there's again no overlap whatsoever. So which cones are these? Which, what, or, or, and there's no uh, overlap with rhodopsin either. I just don't have the picture here. So could this really be those double cones that we theoretically had mentioned they could be a good candidate? And this is indeed the case. So the double cones have eudopsin, and there is a very nice overlap with eudopsin and CRY4. So CRY4 is a uniquely located in the double cones 
and long wavelength single cones who also have eudopsin. So it's in these two types of cones, outer segments only. Of course, you can find it in the inner segment when it's on the way to the outer segment, but uh, it's, in, it's mainly in the outer segments. That, I think, is, of course, is very interesting because this is actually what we kind of predicted before we knew this result. So that the double cones could be quite interesting, and that's actually 40% of the cones in the eye of a bird. So unlike a mouse, a, mouse, a bird only has 20% rods and 40% double cones. And then it, they are tetrachromats plus double cones. So they see very, very good color. OK, so that's at least in line with that. That's, of course, no proof. But this is at least interesting, because people don't really know what the double cones are doing. And it's 40% of the cones. Another interesting result that um, Anja achieved together with Angelika Einwich from our group was that she looked at cryptochrome expression during the migratory season of these night migratory songbirds compared to the non-migratory season. And what she found was that cry four were two to two and a half times more strongly expressed on the mRNA level at the same time of day, of course, as in the non-migratory season. And that difference you do not find in chicken, which don't migrate. So that's, of course, also no proof, but it's an interesting observation that CRY4 is the only cryptochrome which is very strongly expressed in the migratory season compared to the non-migratory season. So our conclusion in our group is that our working hypothesis at the moment is that CRY4 is currently the hottest candidate as a light-dependent magnetoreceptor compass molecule. And now, before the Drosophila and mouse people ask a question, I will go to the next slide. Why haven't you done a knockout cryptochrome bird? That's the obvious thing to do. Yes. We started three, four, five years ago uh, with viruses and uh, RNAi and things like that, trying to see if we can do this. And so far, we have wonderful constructs in cell culture that knocks it out very efficiently. 90% knockdown, which is good. But so far, we haven't found the right virus to get it into all of the cells in the eye. So that's where we are standing. But this is, of course, something that has to be done. And I think it will be doable eventually. OK, any questions to the cryptochrome part? Yes? I just wonder why you use chickens as opposed to young, naive birds of the same species. Because I would expect that the sensory mechanism is also in the young birds of the same species. I, I, I would co consider that a very risky con control. The reason why we use chicken is because we had them in the lab and they are definitely non-migratory and uh, I don't have to catch wild birds to kill for these experiments. We have a significant, uh, uh, we must consider ethics very, very carefully because we need to kill a small number of birds that are wild caught and therefore we have to think very much about which uh, animals we use and how many animals we, we, we sacrifice. Uh, you suggested an overlap between well, we, we don't know, and, and I would say to, to that old study, it's from 2004, and we know a lot more since 2004. So actually that activation only shows that the, the activation, you see it was only in the ganglion cells. Yeah, yeah. And that's because they are the only sp spiking uh, neurons in the, in the eye, and they're the only ones that express the CFOS and, and, and uh, SENC or ERG1. So actually, that experiment only shows that information is leaving the eye under these low light conditions. The, 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 the Aussagekraft, the, the, the importance of that, I would say, has diminished with time. So the overlap is not the important. No, the OLED is not the important part anymore. We thought at that time that it may be important, but it's not that important anymore. It's important that there are activities so that information leaves to the brain. Yeah. And you cannot, you cannot use CFOS or SENC or ERG1 to look at which photoreceptor is involved because they don't express them. Yes? I'm not to understand. Can you just repeat again what, what the mechanism, the proposed mechanism for the practicum, once it undergoes this reaction in terms of the channels that are being opened. We don't know that yet. Because, I mean, if this literally activates 
it's like a competing magnet it activates the photoreceptor as with a normal photon for vision, then you have, you imagine that they would have a, you know, a, a reddish-like image superimposed on the normal pattern vision of whatever is out there. And then you can think of an experiment, for example, where you would provide, I mean, I don't remember how the virtual experiments were done, was the light available throughout the visual scene or not. But if you provide a point source, then you said actually only you activate one part of retina, so you'd actually not be able to see the magnetic uh, field. So you couldn't do it. There, there are too many assumptions behind that suggestion. That has been suggested many times to us to simulate those patterns. But in those calculated patterns that you see there, there are many assumptions. And there's a lot of things we don't know about the biology yeah. yet. So it would be dangerous, I think. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if you have a point source that is, that is blue versus a diffuse light is blue, you, you should see a difference. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. We, we, can, we, can, we can discuss that. I would have to think more about that idea, but I, I think it would be difficult small, because... a small part of the photoreceptors will get the right uh, information, or they get the photons, yeah, okay. uh, and then you will not be able to see the pattern, whatever it is. You don't need to know anything about the pattern, you just see a small part of the pattern. But if you have these uh, double cones next to each other, then some of them would get, both get much light. There would still be this magnetic modulation, <coughs> and then in other parts you cannot make complete darkness in all the other parts of the eye. So they would just get less light input, and again, if you compare by two neighboring sensors, that are independent of light intensity. I'm not sure that would work, but I will. They'll get nothing, because if it's really a point source, only a small part of the retina will get the photons. Mm -hmm. so you, should have, you should have a really dramatic difference between a, you know, a light source that is a point source uh, versus a diffused light that has the same average number of photons, but it's spread over the field. I would think, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not so sure, but I would like to discuss that afterwards in peace, okay. because that is maybe possible. But if it, and if it's possible, I'm very open to doing such an experiment, but I have to be convinced that it would really show uh, something. Yeah. Okay, last question. Um, I have a question regarding to the light wavelength. Since it's a, um, it seems that like it's a short wavelength rather than the long wavelengths offer enough energy for triggering the, the uh, electron transfer. Um, but why is this only this uh, uh, kind of range of this wavelengths, but not even shorter, like uh, this uh, UV or even gamma ray or something like this, will also trigger the, this kind of electron transfer chain or something? Well, I mean, I may refer that question to Peter, but I mean, I presume that the the crypto the flavin basically has a quite a broad absorption. Uh, 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 Curve, but Peter can probably answer that more precisely than me. Yeah, I mean UV would work as well. I mean the real problem is at the other end of the spectrum. Why do the birds? Uh, why are they able to use their colours on the green light, which won't produce radical birds? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on and say okay. So the only thing, the only thing we learned about the. Uh, experiment that I was asked about before is that there's information leaving the eye at night under low light conditions. So one of the next questions we asked is where in the brain is magnetic compass information processed? So basically we asked garden warblers to uh, orient in a round arena with a round perch, and you can, get them, you can get them to do their migratory restlessness on the perch without bumping into the sides all the time. And you have cameras to make sure they don't sleep, because then the uh, ERG1 or CFOS expression goes down very strongly. And we now waited, this took a very long time to do these experiments, because we waited till the birds either showed one hour of constant migratory restlessness without bumping into the wall too often, or the birds were sitting still but awake in breaks of migratory restlessness for an hour without sleeping. And we did this by sitting in front of the computer and making a cross for a movement of opening or closing the eyes or head movement. And it could take three, four nights before we got that condition that we could take the bird. But if you do that, then we would expect that they would sense the magnetic field both during migratory restlessness and in the breaks where they are still awake and therefore should get the sensory input whether they use it at that time as behavior or not. Like if a bird sits stills or not, if it, 
if, it, uh, if you play a sound, it will record it anyway. So we thought that would be two good conditions, because otherwise it would be difficult to separate uh, potential magnetic activation from motor activity. So basically what we saw was that there was one part of the forebrain on both sides of the brain named, that we named cluster N that is very, very highly activated. This is uh, as, uh, in, uh, uh, in situ hybridization on mRNA level of SYNC, uh, or ERG1, I think they call it more now. Um, and white here means activity. And there's very high level of activity in a garden warbler in this cluster N region. And this was consistent among all birds, and it was strikingly active compared to the rest. During the daytime, when these night migratory songbirds do not migrate, there is no activation of this region. OK, doesn't prove anything, but it's an interesting observation. If you now look at a non-migratory bird, and in this case it's a zebra finch, and you look at day and night, you see some activation both day and night in this region, but you don't see any strikingly different activation to the rest of the brain, and no strikingly different activation between day and night. And we've reproduced this in European robins, which are not closely related to garden warblers. They show the same. And we also reproduce this with canaries, uh, which are not too closely related to zebra finches. And we see the same as here. So OK, it's N2 migrants and N2 non-migrants. OK, you may be able to find other birds where it's different. But at least we thought, OK, that's interesting. What A lot is going on in this area. Let's see if we can guess what's going on in this area. So basically. We then thought, OK, if light-dependent magnetoreception is true, then if you cover up the eye of the bird, then this activity should go away. Because if there's no light, you don't get the light activation, and the sensors should not work. And if you cover up this eye, then the activity should go away in this part of the brain. And if you cover this eye, it should go away in this part of the brain. So we tried one eye, two eye cups. Uh, and basically what we see is that this is now from a European robin, a blow up of cluster N in the European robin. If they have eyes open, you have high levels of activity, and you cover up the eyes, the activity disappears to a large degree. OK, so that also doesn't really prove anything, but it proves that input into cluster N is visual. And that's a prerequisite, for again, for this to be potentially true. Then we thought, OK, so input into cluster N is visual. So let's trace the neuronal connections between the eye and this, and this place, just to see if they are connected. And this was a work of Dominic Hayes, and he injected a backward tracer into cluster N and a forward tracer into the eye. And he found that they are meeting up in the GLD, which is the visual salamus. So actually, this is a salamofugal visual pathway. And the activated region, this cluster N region, is the lateral most part of the visual wulst in birds. It's not the whole visual wulst, but the lateral most part. OK, again, that doesn't prove anything, but it's an interesting observation again, because it is the, if you look at the most active parts of a bird brain when they do magnetic compass orientation at night under low light conditions, the most active neurons, according to ERG1 activation, is the ret retinal ganglion cells and this cluster N. And they are part of the thalamofugal visual pathway. I should say that the GLD neurons do not express either ERG1 or CFOS, so you cannot look at these with this method. OK, this was an interesting observation. So we thought, OK, now we are in a new situation. Because now we, we have a candidate region, so let's try to lesion that region and see how that affects behavior. And we had already a different hypothesis, which you have heard about already, which is that the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve is responsible for magnetoreception through maybe iron crystals that at that time people thought were real. OK, so we did a simple experiment. We uh, either did sham lesions of cluster N. And basically, in a natural magnetic field, the birds orient very well. Before you think, how can I get so good orientation here compared to all my other studies, the reason is we tested each bird 25 times in each condition. Because then the noise goes down, because we didn't want to operate very many birds. And when you turn the magnetic field 240 degrees or 120 minus, the bird changed the orientation with our compass in Emlen funnels. If you lesion cluster N, they become random. OK, interesting. If you do sham sections of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, the birds orient wonderful. And when you turn the magnetic field, they turn their orientation. If you now cut the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve on both sides of the brain behind the eye, 
they orient just as fine as before. They orient in the normal magnetic field and they orient when you turn the magnetic field 120 degrees. So there is no difference if you cut this nerve, but if you lesion cluster in, they are unable to do it. So we submitted this paper to Nature and thought we were really, we were really excited. And then the referees came back and said, that's really interesting, but, and I guess we all know this but from referees. <laughs> so basically, and the but was, maybe this is just motivation to migrate. Maybe this or night vision. And this is not magnetoreception. All right. I was pretty sure that it was not just night vision because the birds jump around in the funnels just as much as they do down here, and if birds can't see, they just sleep. So I was pretty sure about that, but then we did some conditioning experiments with the lesion birds contra the non-lesion bird, and we could show that their visual uh, detection limit for light dots was 200 times dimmer than the light we had in this uh, uh, experiment. So they could see, but the other one is more tricky. The one with, this is just motivation to migrate. That tends to be an excuse. If somebody doesn't like a study in navigation, then they are basically just saying that. This may be just motivation. So we thought, OK, but we have a chance to do that. Because birds have three compasses. They have a star compass, a sun compass, and a magnetic compass. If this is magnetic compass information, then they should still be able to use their sun compass and their star compass, and only the magnetic compass should not work. And if it's motivation to migrate, all three should not work. So we did that experiment. So if you test them outdoors under the setting sun and it's spring, the birds orient north. The lesioned ones, these are all lesioned birds. If you test them under a planetarium in, a, in our shipping school near Oldenburg, then, and you simulate the local stars, they orient north. But if you only give them the magnetic field, they are completely random. So this really suggests that cluster N is involved in processing uh, light-dependent magnetic compass information. So these, it's very difficult to explain these data if cluster N is not involved in processing magnetic compass information and we know the pathway from the eye via the thalamus to the forebrain. Yes? Well, were these experiments done in the same bird? So this is the same bird that not oriented under magnetic field, they did orient? Yes, the they're the same birds. Because they looked like there were many more birds in the magnetic. Oh, OK. But that's because, yeah, that's right. We have tested many more birds in the magnetic field. Because if you have random, you need to test many birds before you have convincing random. So it's a subset. Let's put it that way. So the, the birds in the, in the stars and in the um, uh, sun are, the, the, are also in the magnetic condition. But to get convincingly random, we needed more animals. Yeah. Uh, do you have a hypothesis what cluster N does in non-migratory birds? Um, I can tell you that I don't see this activation in non-migratory birds. So I don't see it in pigeons either. So I don't know. But I, it's probably just part of the visual boost. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, do you have any clue about this cluster N uh, function other than this uh, 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 magnetic field sensing? Because I think the one region in the brain should not only responsible for a single function of something. Well, we don't know that yet, but I mean, the, the, because you are going to ask me in the end, where's the electrophysiology, and, and that is not done yet. Okay? So. so I don't know what it's doing otherwise. But it's the visual boost, so it's probably doing some of the things that the visual boost is normally doing. But I mean, the, the activation here is quite striking. And if you are a long-distance migratory bird, sensing magnetic compass cues is very, very important to your life. So it is actually possible that this area is really focused strongly on that. It would mean that birds would see the axis of the magnetic field lines indirectly through sure shading on top of whatever else they are seeing. So to the bird, magnetic sensing would just be vision, like a new channel of vision. OK. Um, could the bird's magnetic sense really be based on quantum mechanics? And as Peter pointed out, one critical way of testing that is to look at radio frequency field effects on this behavior. Because a radio frequency field 
is of like a megahertz, changes its uh, orientation basically or, or its intensity with a, such a high frequency that a little magnetite crystal could not move that fast. And also the intensity of the radio frequency fields are about a thousand times weaker than the actual field. So even if they could follow it, they would, it would not turn the orientation of the magnetite crystal. But for quantum mechanical reasons, there would be sensible reasons why it should have an effect on the radical pair mechanism. So now I will tell you about an experiment that was completely unplanned. It came out of emergency. So we are looking at, going to look at RF noise effects. But this is only because we had to look at it for other reasons. So I moved from, from Denmark via Canada to um, Oldenburg with this young research group. And then I came to Oldenburg and did the funnel experiments which have done, been done in 50 different labs in the world and they didn't work. They were always random. This was highly frustrating. Five migratory seasons in a row. I had PhD students putting birds into funnels every single night and getting nothing. Not very pleasant. Okay. So we tried to change the food, the cage size, the daylight cycle, all the kind of things you should change. No effect. Until one day my electrophysiology postdoc, Niels Lasse Schneider, suggested why, when I do recordings from nerve cells, I use a, a Faraday cage to kind of uh, reduce the electromagnetic noise. Can't we do the same with the birds? And normally I would say this is complete bollocks because this is not sensible by biological material in that sense. The reason why you do it for electrophysiology is a different one. But I was desperate. <laughs> so basically, this iron screening is not a good idea because iron will make the, earth, the static earth field inhomogeneous and it will reduce its magnitude. But if you use aluminium, this is good because aluminium has a very interesting property. It lets static fields through undisturbed, but it screens time dependent fields if it's grounded. So we screened, we, we, we put aluminium walls in all our huts or wooden huts, and it was like a miracle. The birds oriented. And this is the radio frequency intensity of the noise at the University of Oldenburg if you don't screen and this is the radio frequency the magnetic component of the radio frequency noise if you screen this is the electric component and because these are different it means that you are within 10 wavelengths of the source this is a so-called near field effect otherwise they should be identical okay great then I went on to do this with the lesions in the brain and so on because that was what we had planned to do originally. But it was immediately clear to me that if this difference in behavior was really because of the screening of the radio frequency noise, this would be highly interesting because the level of this radio frequency noise is a thousand times weaker than the WHO got, uh, maximum levels of electromagnetic uh, noise disturbance for humans. Next season, I get a new student, and it didn't work again. And I was like, what? Now I have the screens. I go out, work with the student. It looks like she does everything right. Until I go around the hut and notice that she has forgotten to connect the grounding. She has basically forgotten to turn a screw. Then we turned the screw, and then it worked again. And I thought, wow, that's a cool experiment. So at the end of that season, the last two weeks of the season, we were done with what we planned to do. And then I said, you know, I would like some control data. Just test the birds under the natural magnetic field. I want to make sure they are still oriented. What the student didn't know was that every two days, I connected the grounding on this hot and not on this hot. And then I switched them every two days to do a double-blinded experiment. And then I asked the student, so how did the birds orient? And she was like, yeah, kind of a tendency in the right direction, but it doesn't look too good. Okay, here is A, B, C, D. 
She analyzed again, and this is a result. The two first days grounded, oriented. The first two days ungrounded, disoriented. The next two days grounded, and the next two days ungrounded. And this was switched. So one hot was, so this is the first four days mixed, and this is the, first, the second four days mixed. So it means that we could turn on and off the orientation of these birds by turning a screw on the grounding. I thought, that's pretty cool. That suggests to me that the grounding of the aluminium has some kind of causal relationship to the behavior of the animals. But it still doesn't prove that it's this RF noise, because maybe that does something else, the, 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 the grounding or the screen. I don't know what, but it could be something else. So the next thing we needed to do was we needed to go in, and now in the screen hut, we regenerated the noise artificially. Okay? And then they are disoriented. So in the grounded hut, but with the equipment, the, the radio frequency generated artificially, it's a little bit more constant than the natural one, but that's what we could do technically. They can't orient. Now the problem is, if electromagnetic noise from equipment is a problem, then maybe just the fact that you put the signal generator in there could be a problem. So we decided we need to test the same thing, but with the signal generator making the minimum possible output, but it's still running. And then you have this level of disturbances, which is almost like having no signal generator in there. And then the birds orient. And they turn the orientation when you turn the magnetic field 120 degrees. <coughs> okay. Now I'm pretty convinced that it is really the rate of frequency noise doing this problem. And I would like to say all these experiments were done double blind and several of the key results were repro reproduced independently by two different generations of students. Then, so it is really caused by this electromagnetic noise, it seems. So now there was this thing with the Lamor frequency. That's 1.4 megahertz. So I thought, OK, no problem. Now we just make the signal generator cut this uh, noise up, and we'll find out where the problem lies. And this will tell us a lot about the mechanism when we, co when we uh, collaborate with Peter. So this is uh, what we thought was a good experiment. Uh, radio frequency noise up to about half a megahertz, and one that starts at about uh, half a megahertz up to about three megahertz but it certainly includes the LAMO frequency. And the other one doesn't. So I expected the birds to be disoriented in one and oriented in the other. But that's not what we saw. <coughs> they were disoriented in, in both of them. And the birds were oriented if we run the same equipment but at the minimum output again as a control. And these are the same birds always. Sorry. These are the same birds tested in all the conditions. OK, so this means that the disruptive effect on magnetic compass orientation is not limited to a specific frequency. At that time, that was controversial. OK, I still had one problem with these results. What radio frequency, this is middle wave radio. And you can listen to the radio when you drive in your car almost anywhere. So how come the birds can arrive in Africa if they are disturbed by radio frequency fields that are available everywhere? Well, so we thought, okay, we need, this is what happens when you, when you are in the natural disturbances around the university full of electronic equipment of all kinds. But what, can you find a natural location where you don't need to screen? So maybe you can find a natural location where the disturbances are much lower. And this was very easy, you just need to go one kilometer outside of town in a wooden uh, horse stable, then you have that. You don't need to screen. And then we took the birds there, and without any screening or anything, <coughs> they orient fine. So basically the radio signals are weaker than this intensity, but can still be picked up by your antenna in your car. So then we were convinced and the referees were convinced that basically this is really due to the um, radio frequency noise that these birds can't orient. And this is quite important, so well, this is just a fantasy how that can be, you can maybe imagine that, because I thought I should have something on Drosophila. 
So basically, um, you have here the magnetic field effect, where in Peter's analogy was a fly landing on this uh, uh, granite block. So how could you imagine what the RF fields would be? You have them in all kinds of frequencies. So you can basically imagine they are much weaker interactions. But you could basically imagine now that a whole swarm of Drosophila are basically hitting this stone from all kinds of directions at unpredictable times before the fly has the time to land. This is of course also an analogy with a lot of limitations. Yeah? And now this broadband effect was puzzling us at the beginning because this was not what we were told should be the expectation at that time. We were supposed to be, find a Lamo frequency effect, but we didn't. And Peter talked about these hi hyperfine interactions and already showed you uh, graphs <coughs> like this. And if you now simulate a radical pair, as Peter also showed you, where one of the radicals have four hyperfine interaction and one has zero, you do get this very specific uh, La uh, Lamor frequency effect. But that's only if the other radical is very far away, much further than it is in, in likely to be in real life. If you start adding hyperfine interactions to the other radical, you spread out this. And just with one in hyperfine interaction, you don't expect an effect at the Lamo frequency, but at some other specific frequencies. So actually this noise that we observe around the university looks pretty good like this, what you actually would have with four and four. And in reality, there are probably more. So the conclusions that we made was that um, Magnetic compass information is processed in the visual system and birds are therefore highly likely to see the magnetic field, so it's likely to be a visual input. And the magnetic compass is almost certainly based on spin chemistry and must be quantum mechanical in nature because otherwise it's impossible to get anywhere near explaining these radical, uh, uh, radio frequency effects. Time-dependent electrom and subordinate electromagnetic field disturbs the Earth's magnetic compass, probably due to interferences with the electron and nuclear spins. It is fair to say that the current modeling of Peter cannot explain at the moment, with the two radicals we are looking at at the moment, cannot explain that the radicals should react to uh, RF fields as weak as the ones they react to. So there is still some additional explanation needed. <coughs> To do further experiments, we have built what is at the moment at least unique uh, in the world. It's a, it's a facility where it's a completely wooden house built of wood and uh, copper and aluminium. And in there we have uh, electromagnetic uh, noise, uh, 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 well, time-dependent field screens that screen all frequencies from about a kilohertz up to three or four gigahertz by a factor of a million. So we can really start from zero and then add the different frequencies as we, as we please. And we can change, and, and because it's aluminum again, all the static fields are perfectly Earth's fields, very homogeneous, and the double rounded uh, coils are used to manipulate the static fields. So basically it looks like this light dependent mole mo light sensitive molecules in the eye could really be the magnetoreceptors in these birds. What about the other hypothesis? Is this all wrong? Can I ask a question just before you move on? Yeah. So a question I'm often asked, and I don't know the answer to, is what is special about the campus of the University of Oldenburg? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't anyone else need to shield their birds to see orientation? Well, I think there are several people who need to shield. Uh, there are many, like the Phillips, John Phillips lab always screen his experiments. Uh, the, the Czech group always screen their experiments. So there are many places, the only place where you apparently don't need to screen is in Frankfurt. But, and you said that the other labs have done yes. the tunnel experiments. But they do it at field sites. The Swedes don't do their orientation experiments at Lund University. They do it at field stations in the middle of nowhere. All my experiments in Denmark were done at field stations in the middle of nowhere. All the Americans who have done these kind of experiments were doing them at field stations. And the reason why they do it, you need to be at a tip to catch enough birds to do these kind of experiments. So that's the major difference. Yes. So what do the people in, I mean, can't you just measure this in Frankfurt? And yes, we have measured there is disturbances similar to here. Uh, similar to Oldenburg. 
is right next to a radio tower, a, a, a radio and television tower. I cannot explain it. Even their static fields, just behind the, the wooden huts, they have a, an, iron, uh, um, an iron fence running. And the magnetic fields in those huts are completely unhomogeneous. But, so that experiment where they tested them under different wavelengths is a fairly influential experiment of, I mean, for the hypothesis. Has that, has that not been repeated under monochromatic light or... Or unscreened, or has no one repeated that experiment? Well, I have now tried to repeat many experiments of the Frankfurt group, and I have been able to replicate very few. Because yeah, that particular experiment is kind of based on the wavelength needed for the compass. But well, there is an experiment by Rachel Muheim who has at least reproduced part of that. So that there are some light effects that has been repro reproduced by Rachel Muheim. Um, I have not really done it yet because, you know, I cannot make a career out of just reproducing experiments of other people. I need to do some experiments of my own as well. Uh, so, so we have tried to rep, they claim that the magnetic compass is only in the right eye. We have reproduced that. They can use any eye they want. Uh, there has been the, the, the uh, this, that it's only the Lamor frequency. The Lamor frequency was uh, predicted by Torsten Ritz in year 2000 probably because at that time it was very difficult to calculate on realistic radicals. And it now turns on out, out. once you start calculating on re realistic radicals, then uh, you don't expect an effect only at the Lamo frequency. You expect a broadband effect. And we didn't know that when we did these experiments, but that's what we found. And we have tried to replicate the Frankfurt experiments actually with the, the Lamo frequency. That was actually the reason that DARPA paid a million euro to build that building. That was to replicate that experiment. And basically we find weak or no effects of single frequencies, at least we find much stronger effects of broadband fields. And we think that one of the problems is that all other groups, until we published that paper, have not measured the disturbances in this entire range. They have just measured very narrowly at the frequency they thought were important. And now it turns out that if you do such uh, monochromatic fields, you have all the harmonics, for instance, which they just didn't measure. So there has been a huge problem with measuring the actual stimulus in the past. But I am not responsible for explaining what they, what they have reported in Frankfurt. No, no, no. It just seems to be such an important experiment. Yeah. yeah. But I have tried to replicate some of the most important findings because I need to know for myself what I personally can see because that's important for me what way I want to continue. And in all cases, it was not to show that it was not the case. It was because we had then the next experiment, the next experiment, the next experiment, if this was true. Yeah? But we have now tried to replicate four different things. Three of them have been published and we can't. And, then, and we have a fourth one that we can't either. But we can replicate the, the inclination compass. We can replicate that they actually are not oriented under the uh, horizontal field. So, but there's a limit to how much of my time I can spend with the replication. Yes. Sorry, maybe I missed it. But uh, you're saying that radio frequency can affect the time interactions. And I was wondering how. I mean, is, are the interactions becoming more isotropic? Because that would disrupt the orientation. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I cannot, I'm very, very bad at hearing in background noise, so you have to tell it to me again. Okay, sure. So you're saying that radio frequency uh, can affect the hyperfine interactions, and uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, how? Because are the are they interactions becoming more isotropic? Because that would disrupt the orientation, right? But uh, That's a question for Peter, I think that's better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in the same way that the Earth's magnetic field can shift those energy levels yeah. and change the oscillations between single and triple, so in principle, the radio frequency field can do the same. Absolutely. The problem, as Henry mentioned earlier, is that these fields are incredibly weak. Yes. And so quantitatively, we can't explain that effect. But qualitatively, it could be that we're interfering with the conversion of single to triple extent. So, I uh, would like to um, 
ask the question now, could it be that there's also an iron mineral based mechanism? Could there be a second magnetic reception mechanism? Because it's very rarely so that there are, if there are several hypotheses that are all supported by evidence, that then one is completely wrong. So we thought, okay, let's open our eyes and our minds to maybe this is still true in some way. So basically, the birds we had operated here, some had cut trigeminal nerves. We have to kill them. We are not allowed to release them according to the regulations of uh, German law. So we thought instead of killing these birds for nothing, let's try to see if there may be magnetically activated cells in the trigeminal system. Because we have the birds with these operations already and we have to kill them, so let's try to do something sensible. So we know that the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve enters the hindbrain of these birds and terminates in two parts of the hindbrain called PR5 and SP5. And so basically we, we asked, we, we exposed them to what we call a super stimulus, which I told the other day, it's uh, every 30 seconds the uh, uh, compass direction changes 90 degrees with some vari small variation in intensity and inclination. And then for five minutes, everything changes very strongly up to 70,000 nanotests on each direction. And then we had zero magnetic field in another group and we had cut nerves and not cut nerves. And the results were the following. In PR5, this is now on the protein level, ERG1 stainings made by Dominic Hayers. And basically what you see here is that there is a horseshoe shaped like region with many active nuclei in the changing magnetic field with a sham operated nerve. If you now make a zero magnetic field with an intact nerve, this activation goes down significantly. And if you take a changing magnetic field and you, the same magnetic field as here, but you cut the nerve, there's also very little activation. If we look into SP5, you see something very similar. So in this uh, medial part, you see very high activation when there's a changing magnetic field and an intact nerve, which disappears if you make a zero magnetic field or if you cut the nerve in the same magnetic field. And quantification-wise, it looked like that. So basically in PR5 and uh, SP5, there was an, uh, an increase in neuronal activation, uh, well, 500 neurons or something like that in PR5. And there were many other recent re regions where there was no difference. So we, of course, need to check that this is not a general effect of, of, of the super stimulus on all kinds of activity in the brain. And this is not the case. So what's the function of this? It's obviously not the compass because you can cut the nerve and then there's no effect whatsoever on the compass orientation. So it cannot be the magnetic compass, but there seems to be magnetically activated neurons here. And then I would like to remind you just of uh, Nikita's talk from Tuesday, where we have done this displacement experiment in collaboration with Nikita, or Nikita in collaboration with us, because it's mainly Nikita's experiment. Uh, basically, we have uh, caught birds in, uh, these are reed warblers, uh, so if you take them at the Ribachi site, they go northeast. And if you displace them to Svenigorod uh, with either a tri real trigeminal dissection or an intact nerve, then you see that the intact birds correct for the displacement and the sectioned birds do not correct for the displacement. So there seems to be uh, necessary to have an intact trigeminal nerve to actually correct for this displacement. And if you now look at the virtual magnetic displacement, this is a real displacement. And now we magnetically displace them, but keep them in Ribachi. Again, they do correct. So we think that it's magnetic. What we have not yet done, and which we of course have to do, is we have to do this virtual displacement with cut nerves. That we have not done yet. So we have not done the combination yet, but this is in progress. OK. So. Currently, it looks like there are two magnetic sensors in many birds. There's a magnetic compass requiring light sensitive molecules in the bird's eyes. It's probably based, or with very high likelihood, based on a, a radical pair mechanism. Cluster N is involved in processing this information and its compass information. There seems to be a second magnetic sense with unknown sensors, but they could very well be uh, uh, iron mineral based. Uh, in the associated with the trigeminal nerve and uh, ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve and that innervates the upper beak and the skin frontal skin here 
So it should be somewhere there. And this information is at least partly processed in PR5 and SP5 in the hindbrain. And at the moment, we are trying to find out where the next processing stations are. And this, I believe, but have not proven, that it is probably detecting magnetic intensity, which would give you north-south, but not east-west. And it seems that it, if the birds don't get both north-south and east-west position, they seem to be uh, not correcting. So there seems to be two magnetosensory pathways, one associated with the visual system and one related to the trigeminal nerve. Yes. Um, so presuming this, these two areas of the brain that potentially involved in the map encompass sense work together, say the birds are using both a magnetic sense and a magnetic compass, is there a clear area where the information is kind of integrated? We are working on that. Okay, cool. Yes, that's an obvious thing we are working on. So here are the, some of the perspectives. So we aim, of course, and, and I mean, my, some people ask me then the question, why would you have two different magnetic sensors? Right? Why don't not just one? Well, if you want to build a sensor for magnetic direction, you would also, if you build a technical sensor, it's completely different from one that should sense intensity. Because the one that detects direction has to be independent of intensity. It should give the same compass reading when intensity changes. So when you move north-south. So it should not care about intensity. The other way around, a, and a sensor of magnetic intensity should not care about direction. Because if it cares about direction, then you will get a different movement, a measurement, depending on which way you are pointing. And it's actually very difficult if you have a, uni, uh, a directional uh, flux gate magnetometer and want to measure the Earth's field to measure the total field strengths because you have to orient it very, very precisely to get a good reading. So technically you would build these two sensors differently, so I'm not terribly surprised that the birds would have two different systems for those two things. Yes? But how do you explain the experiment on the, the, the Gemini nerve cut and less uh, like back at guards, which well, which I oriented perfectly towards the goal and navigated very well, and so there is no, because, okay, I can understand the results of only pigeons, that if you cut the trigeminal nerve, nothing happened, they go perfectly, but they are not migratory birds, so it's quite plausible. And it's too short distance, probably. Too short distance, yeah. Well, yes, too short distance, but then we have also <coughs> some <coughs> down, uh, uh, pigeons uh, subjected to magnetic pulses and released at 110 kilometers and uh, still they go. So, but what about uh, the, the, the results on, um, on the gulls? They are migratory birds, they are long distance migratory birds. So, which is, which is uh, to your opinion, the difference between these two, the songbirds, and because maybe this is only for the songbirds. So it's not, I wouldn't say migratory birds in general, because then you have to say, yeah, but, but how do you explain these uh, res tracking results on, on gulls? Well, so first, it, first of all, that those gull results are interesting, but not clear. They are very low in, and there are some of the birds in the different groups that does something what they shouldn't have done. And that's one of the reasons why, I, I have not been a referee, but it's one of the reasons I think why that paper went through a lot of revisions before it got published, because it is... Because the mapping was no. lazy to resubmit. Okay, okay, because it took at least a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and he <laughs> talked about it for many years no, no, before no, he published no, it. No, no, it okay, no. but it is not, it's a very low end. And secondly, gulls are mainly migrating during the day. So, so it's also a completely different uh, ecology. And as I mentioned before, we have looked in cluster N in a day and night migratory bird. And if you look at that, you do not see cluster N activation at daytime in a day migratory yeah, bird. I'm talking about well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is one result and the N is like four or five in each group. It's the only tracking study. Mm -hmm. Pigeons that, but the only tracking study that had been performed on wild birds with <coughs> trigeminal nerve cut. And all trigeminal nerve cut birds but one end up to go to, to, the, to the goal. 
to Lake Victoria on the Nile Delta. So I think that at best you can say that for uh, some birds this is the system, but I wouldn't generalize to all birds. No, I don't generalize to all birds because I have also worked on albatrosses where there is absolutely no effect of mani magnetic manipulation. So I don't think there is a universal answer. And I think in the first day, for those who were not here on the first day, one of the most important things I said on the first day is that birds use all information available, not just the magnetic field, not just olfaction, not just anything. It uses everything. And they have many re apparently redundant backup mechanisms. So of course, cutting the nerve in free flight, they may have so many other mechanisms in free flight that they may be able to cope with not getting the information from one sense. Whereas in the funnel, and I think that's the advantage and the disadvantage of the funnel, the advantage of the funnel is that you really limit the sensory inputs to what you control. And under those conditions, the, the, the results of those displacements experiments and so on in the funnels with the, with the night migratory songbirds are very, very clear. That I, it is very possible that if you would let them fly free, you would maybe need to knock out more than one system in order to get um, no proper orientation because they have so many different cues they can use in free flight. Yeah, so but, but, but the, the Gauss experiment showed that if you cut the olfactory nerve, they just go down south and they end up in the desert and they are lost. I mean, they are lost because none of them came back while the trigeminal nerve cut birds homed back to the breeding site. So I think that at least one should be quite uh, careful in, in, in yeah, generalizing. No, no, I, I'm not, I'm, I, if I'm generalizing and I have said birds, then I have met ni meant night migratory songbirds because that's the only birds we can study in these funnels. Yeah, yeah. So it, I'm clearly, I, 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 I think it's extremely clear with these seabirds who have 33% of their uh, brain being olfactory bulb. I mean, it's absolutely clear that in those birds, our experiments also suggest that magnetic, experiment, magnetic is very unimportant to them. So, come back to Nikita's talk about the, the various uh, map mechanisms. So the, the, the declination that provides information about position as well, that will depend on a compass. Yes. So then, if you are able to take you know, his birds or some other birds and displace them either to a location that has the same magnetic intensity but a different declination and cut the ophthalmic branch of the uh, olfactory nerve, or to another location where it's vice versa, the declination is not different, but intensity is different, it's the same species. Uh, yeah, we are doing that. You're doing that? Yeah. Okay. And we are quite far with that. Why can only nice migrating birds be tested in funnels? Uh, why, why can't any what? Why can you only test the migrating, the night migrating songbirds in funnels? Are oh, they all night migrating? I don't know. Yeah, uh, most night, uh, all these small insect eating songbirds, they are night migrating. Okay, so that, so all these small birds that are easy to put in a the funnel, they are night migratory. And if you try to use, there are few small birds that are also day migratory, and a few that's own only day migratory, but all of those migrate in flocks. They don't migrate alone, the day migratory ones. So that's a little bit dif difficult. And as I say, we have tri tried one of the really few birds that do both, and this is the meadow pipit. It migrates at night and continues until like 11 in the morning. So there it's already light. And we looked, is there a cluster N activation in those birds at night and day? And that paper is totally overlooked. Apparently nobody is interested. But anyway, I think it's a very important finding because what we found is that cluster N is only activated at night. And remember I said before that uh, you, in, the, in the night you have these railway tracks in the, in the outer segments, at day you don't have them. At the daytime in the cones, they are highly active, involved in color vision and all kinds of things. And there are much fewer cryptochromes than there are uh, options. So it would be very difficult from my thinking how they would ever be able to detect a weak magnetic field effect on top of color vision. I, I think that would be very difficult to imagine. But at night the cones are silent. The cones are not, the, 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 the color vision is not going on during the night. So it could really be that it's specialized for nighttime navigation. Because during the daytime the sun compass is always most important. There's not such a need not such a dramatic need for uh, a magnetic compass as, as if you are night mi migratory. So this is all speculation, but it, there's at least some trends that come together that suggest something in that direction. Uh, so what we aim 
is, of course, to understand exactly how the magnetic sense works from the biophysical principles and molecular mechanisms all the way to the perception and behavior of the intact bird. And we also would like to answer this fundamental question, whether there are qu fundamentally quantum mechanical effects in biology, because this is quite important, because as Peter sh showed you, um, if you use these spin uh, chemistry effects, then you can in principle sense uh, stimuli in the world that are a million to ten million times weaker than what we think is the current limit of biological sensory systems. So that can be quite significant and therefore we want to understand that. Uh, finally I would like to make, since I have, um, I'm very impressed by the quality of the students, I take the liberty to advertise a little bit something. Because the University of Oldenburg has decided to make magnetoreception and animal navigation one of its main focuses in the next decade at least. And as part of that we have made a big application where we try, to, where we want to study magnetic reception and its integration in navigation from the quantum mechanics via signals transduction, uh, processing in the retina, processing in the brain, Nahum is involved with, uh, with uh, um, uh, spatial cell types in the bats, which do birds, fish and bats. Uh, until uh, navigation, behavior in the lab to uh, behavior in the wild. So we have uh, s studies of birds and fish in the wild. And we don't know yet if we will get this for sure, but we are through the first round, so our chance now is 70 to 80 percent to actually get it. And the university has therefore agreed that we can recruit at, at least two young research group leaders over the next one to three years. So we are very interested, if somebody is interested, to joining this community and this approach. And I think there are many potential candidates in this room, so this is why I'm saying it. So basically, what in Germany there are some uh, uh, systems that you can apply for. They are called Eminöter, VW Freigeist or similar. These are uh, great funding opportunities. I had one of these as a young uh, researcher. They are more or less identical to ERC starting grants. Uh, you get one to one and a half million euro for five years to build up your own group. You are independent. Uh, you have to come up with an original suggestion that dif di differentiates you from the rest and you have to integrate into a community, so at a university, where it makes sense to integrate your type of research. And uh, especially excellent young female scientists are particularly uh, um, of high chances to get these because the universities of Germany of course would like to increase the number of female scientists. That does not mean that highly qualified male scientists don't have a chance. I'm just saying this uh, to make that clear. And another one is that if the SFB, the Sonderforschungsbereich, is finally granted, we will write out two new V2 slash V3 professorships in animal navigation research in the next years. And if it's not granted, we will at least get one position in animal re ecology related to animal navigation, which we will announce in the next two to three years. And if anybody could be interested in any of these things, please come and talk to me. And with this, I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators. Of course, what we have done, have we have not done alone. We have done it through many, many, many collaborators. And I've had the experience that Nahum told about yesterday that because this is quite a cool system that you can explain to almost anybody, uh, it's quite easy to recruit collaborators who are able to do something I can't do. So therefore, many things we have done in this area have been in collaboration with researchers who were very, very good at methods that we didn't know about because I don't have a method, I have a question. So I want to understand magnetoreception from a biological perspective and I need new methods all the time and you cannot be a specialist in all these methods at the same time. So therefore you need collaborations and I'm very, very happy to have been able to uh, collaborate with many different people around the world and of have, having had fantastic postdocs and PhD students who have done all these experiments because as we all know, once the group get a certain size, it's limited what chance you get to set, do the experiments yourself, unfortunately. In particular, I would like to thank Peter, with whom I have collaborated now for more than 10 years, and there's no way I could do the quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, Peter is a brilliant mind in thinking about potential solutions to potential problems. Uh, and also Eric Jarvis was particularly important in the, 
in the searching for cluster N because he's one of the developer of that whole SYNC and EIT1 method. So when we had to learn that, we went to his lab and we collaborated with him. But I also did a lot with Martin Wild, Ilya Solovyov from Odense and Ona Günther Kühn's lab in Bochum. So with this, I would like to, and I would like to thank the Volkswagen Stiftung because they paid my bills for 13 years. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>